Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to Connecting the Dots for Negroes, Part 1. Important notice, it is never our intention to offend anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. There is also no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to misinform anyone with our videos. Remember, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Steve Jobs Thank you to all of you that donate to support us. We appreciate it and you can always support us at um, paypal.me forward slash our renaissance or patreon.com forward slash our renaissance. Thank you. Now, before we delve into our topic of today, let us quickly look at something we did not mention in our series on time factor for Negroes, which is very important though. So on your screen, you will see a 1751 calendar. From our little Excel calendar, you will see that January 1751 also started on Friday, 1st January 1751. But if you looked at the same time and date, in timeanddate.com, January 1751 started on a Tuesday. So it is Tuesday 1st January 1751, while elsewhere it is Friday 1st January 1751. So if we also look at January 1752, we will see that it started on a Saturday 1st January 1752. And the same with our little Excel calculator. But if you looked at the 1752 calendar from timeanddate.com, you will discover that September had many days in it missing. So your question becomes why? What happened? How does that affect your so-called Shabbat or day of rest created by the Most High? This should be your question. But let us take it a little bit backward before we delve into our topic of the day. So from our little Excel calculator, January 1611 started on a Saturday. And remember 1611 was when the King James Version of the Bible was introduced. And that is our interest in 1611. So it shows us that Saturday 1st was when that year started. But from timeanddate.com, January 1st, 1611 was a Tuesday. However, from this other website, January 1611 was also a Saturday, which corresponds with what our little Excel spreadsheet told us. So if we reference the Holy Bible containing the Old and the New Testaments published in 1611, that is the King James Version of the Bible for 1611, we see the following, that the first day of January 1611 was actually a Sunday. But the calendars we have show us that it is either a Saturday or a Tuesday, whichever one, we should know that it's, there can only be one correct answer. But what does this take us to? It takes us to the fact that what you have as your Saturday and Sunday today, or all the deb debates and arguments of which one is the correct Shabbat established by the creator of heaven and earth, is actually a lie because they are all based on the slave master's narratives. They are all based on the slave master's foundations and the slave master is a liar. So you see how these things collapse the moment you look back in time. So let us reference a book called A Series of Absolutely Correct Calendars from September 14, 1752 to December 31st, 2200 and it was published in 1916 and there we see the following that the Gregorian calendar is adopted by an act of the British Parliament in 1851, began on Wednesday, September 14th, 1752. This date immediately succeeded Tuesday, September 3rd of the same year in the Julian calendar. The Gregorian calendar is now in use in all Roman Catholic and Protestant countries. So remember, did they also tell you that the Antichrist was going to change times and dates or whatever. But let us move forward. However, the book still showed the September 1752 months having its complete days. Remember, 11 days are missing from the whole thing. 
the essence of bringing you to this is for you to know that the dates and times you are looking at today may not really be what they were supposed to be if they were not meddled with by the slave masters. The calendar for 1752 begins on Wednesday, September 14th. So you understand in the footnotes on this book, you see where it says the same thing. So our interest is to show you why it is important that you look back in time to connect the dots. Connecting the dots for Negroes. Now, for those who might be saying, oh, why are you calling Negroes? We are blacks or we are African or whatever names you choose. Let us quickly reference the history of the Liverpool privateers and the letters of Marquis with an account of the Liverpool slave trade by Goma Williams and it was published in 1897. We see the following. Copy of account sales of Negroes. Sales of 268 Negro slaves imported in the ship African Captain Thomas Trader from Malimba on the account and risk of Messrs. John Cole and Co., owners of the said ship, merchants in Liverpool. Our interest here is where he says, imported in the ship African, which shows us that there was a slave ship called African. So those calling themselves, oh, African, African, may not even know the meaning or the name or the origin. And remember, the Arabs bear their names. The Moroccans bear their names, the Algerians, the Tunisians, the Ethiopians, the Somalis, they all bear their names. So it's still only the Negroes that are subliminally somehow being called African and they don't even know what it means. They embrace it fully. So you see the thing, whereas before they were called Negroes, they were called Ethiopians. So now you see how the identity has been modeled with and everything turned upside and inside out. So you see what we're talking about. So don't complain about whatever name we use. It is because we don't have better choices. If we have better choices or if you can provide us with what you think should be the right name for the group, we'll be happy to adopt them if they are correct historically. And now here is our little question for you before we start. Is it not rather stupid that millions of Negroes were shipped across the ocean or marched across the desert as slaves and no one knows who did. Why do you think the so-called African Americans riot over police killings but turn the other way when slave masters weapons are being used to massacre innocent Negroes in what was Guinea and Negro land? That's our question for you. If you have the answers, please put them in the comment sessions before we now delve into our topic of the day which is about connecting the dots. And remember, as Steve Jobs told us, you don't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Now, have you been following our videos? And have you been reading the comments that come in? There are some comments that um, anchor on what they think we believe and what they wish we should believe. And some even want to present their books for what they are or what they are not. But to move forward, we shall ultimately tell you where we stand but let us reference a book called the new testament in the original greek the text revised by brooke force westcott and fenton john anthony hot american edition by philip sharp an introduction anyway and it was published in 1881 we see the following note the date of publication 1881 and remember the KJV was introduced in 1611. So between 1611 and 1881 is what we are looking at. Sources of the text of the New Testament The original orthographs of the apostolic writings are lost beyond all reasonable hope of discovery and are not even mentioned by the post-apostolic authors as being extant anywhere or as having been seen by them. They perished, probably before the close of the first century, with the brittle paper then in ordinary use, the Egyptian papyrus. Like all other ancient writings, with exception of a few that were accidentally preserved in Egyptian tombs and mummies, are under the lava of Vesuvius at Herculaneum and Pompeii. God has not chosen to exempt the Bible by a miracle from the fate of other books, but has wisely left room for the diligence and research of man, 
who is responsible for the use of all the facilities within his reach for the study of the Bible. He has not provided for inspired transcribers any more than inspired printers, nor for infallible translators any more than infallible commentators and readers. He wastes no miracle. He desires free and intelligent worshippers. Note that he desires free and intelligent worshippers. The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. The Bible in its origin and history is a human as well as a divine book and must be studied under this twofold aspect. It is the incarnation of God's truth and reflects the divine human person of Christ to whom it bears witness to the Alpha and Omega as the way, the tr life and the truth. Even if we had the apostolic autographs, there would be room for verbal criticism since they, like other ancient books, were written as a continuous whole without accents, without punctuations, without division of sentences or words, without titles and subscriptions, without even the name of the author unless it was part of the text itself. So you see that the Bible was not produced from any original manuscript. This is what they are saying. This is just barely 270 years after 1611 KJV. So whenever they got the other one because they claimed they translated the KJV from the original manuscript which cannot be true because if they lost the manuscript then there is no way they could have found it later. This is very important to note before we move forward. Again from the same book we see where it says the text of this edition of the New Testament has been formed exclusively on documentary evidence. No account being taken of any printed edition. Wherever the documents vary from each other, criticism is needed to determine which readings are to be retained as genuine and which are to be rejected as errors that have arisen in the course of transmission. In the introduction, which forms part of the accompanying volume, an attempt has been made to examine at some length the true principles of textual criticism generally and the leading results which follow from their application to the New Testament and a summary of the contents of the introduction is appended to the present volume. A brief and general explanation may however be useful to some readers of the text who may not care to study in detail the discussions and statements of evidence upon which the various conclusions set forth in the introduction are founded. So our interest is for you to understand how they got what you want to uh, sell to everybody today as the word of the Most High, Creator of heaven and earth. Remember, he did not write any book. He never said he wrote a book. And we are going to show you why it is important that you don't see that as his words because it's so imperfect that it's actually blasphemous to say it belongs to him. Even if they are inspired, we need to know who was inspired before we can start believing them. Deadline 1714 Let us reference Atlas Geographus or a complete system of geography, ancient and modern for Africa, containing what was most used in Blue, Veranius, Celarius, etc. Volume 4 and it was published in 1714 and there we see the following that it is talking about the people that lived in Guinea coast or Guinea around that time and it goes further to tell us that Depa concludes with their religion. He says, the Negroes own a God that created and governs heaven and earth but think it needless to serve him because he is good natured whereas they think it is their duty to pray and sacrifice to the devil for fear he should hurt them. They call God Orifa. They have their fetishes or idols of wood, greenhouses, etc. and keep priests who pretend to be magicians and the people apply to them for advice in their doubts. They make a great sacrifice every year to the sea and their greatest oath is by the ocean and their king. They have several festivals which they celebrate with sports, dances, sacrifices and good cheer but barbarously defile them with human victims. To this we thought fit to subjoin David Van Yedel's general account of Benin, read in 1702 because the reader may see how he differs from Depa. So again, we see that the Negroes 
own a God that created and governs heaven and earth, which is our interest here. And from the same book, it tells us that in Negro land, the Negroes can neither read nor write, and to continue them in ignorance, the priests have enjoined it as a law upon themselves to marry into one another's families and to teach nobody else to read or write, so that those poor people have only a confused notion of the being of a god, but think it not necessary to pray to him, alleging that he who causes tempests, thunder, and lightning is so potent that he has no need of our prayers and that it's impossible he can have a son and therefore they abhor the Christian religion. So you see that the Negroes at this point, 1714, abhorred the Christian religion because they did not believe that the creator of heaven and earth could have a son. So please note this point very well. So deadline 1799 let us reference a new universal history of the religious rites, ceremonies and customs of the whole world or a complete and impartial view of all the religions in the various nations of the universe, both ancient and modern, from the creation down to the present time to which is added a geographical description of the various parts, the religious rites and ceremonies of whose inhabitants are described written by William Hurd and it was published in 1799 and there we see the following and you can pause the video and read the entire highlighted portion but our interest is further down where it says but are these poor Africans when brought to the West Indies instructed in religion? No, it is industriously concealed from them Nay, it is not long since they were brought and sold in England like beasts of burden. No encomiums can be too great on Mr. Sharp, who brought the matter to the fountain head of the law, and obtained a solemn judgment that no slave can live in England, that every foreigner, whether an African or from any other part, has to be free. But our interest is where it says at that time they were hiding the so-called religion from anyone because they understood that what they were doing were totally at tangent with what that religion was saying which is still what they are doing till today so here we see again the religion of the inhabitants of the coast of guinea now remember at some point we had mentioned to you that when they were calling the negroes pagans they had never even explored negro land or guinea so they had no understanding of the place and that they are calling them pagans was simply referring to them being of a religion different from European religion. Not that they were pagans as in worshipping something totally unrelated to the creator of heaven and earth. So it goes further down there to tell us that the slave trade carried on in Guinea has given Europeans many opportunities of making themselves well acquainted with the inhabitants. So you see that happy had our merchants been as assiduous to promote the knowledge of christianity and the external happiness of immortal souls but that's not our interest our interest is what brought them there was the slave trade and that they were ignorant of the real religion or the way of life of the people but going further down on the right you see where our interest lies we thought these things necessary to be premised in order to make the reader better acquainted with these people and their religious sentiments, for some of them observed the ceremony of circumcision without assigning any manner of reason for their conduct, which perhaps may be grounded on mere necessity, but should some certain customs be added to it which are in vogue with their neighbors, such as presenting the choicest of their fruits to a particular god called Belly and to the souls of their relations, refraining from eating beef or veal or any kind of shellfish, we may visibly discern the footsteps of Judaism and the paganism of the ancient Egyptians. This hint, we presume, is sufficient for such to draw conclusions from us are fond of reconciling the most distant conjectures. This is our interest here, the footsteps of Judaism. And remember, obedience is greater than sacrifice. They are telling us that these people that were obeying the commandments of the creator of heaven and earth without any books are not children of the most high. 
it's only those that are coming with the books remember the hood does not make the monk but let us move forward so it goes further down to tell us that Pochas has collected abundance of curious observations relating to the religion of these people and their rites and ceremonies notwithstanding they have no books no scriptures nor even any civil laws for their political government yet it is certain they are not destitute of all religion they dedicate and set apart tuesday for the worship of their fetishes as we do sunday to the service of god so they choose what to call god and what to call fetish so these people set apart tuesday and their own is sunday and they say sunday must be to god and this other one is for fetishes remember we showed you where they changed the dates and calendars so chances are that even the tuesday they were talking about could have been the right shabbat based on the creation of heaven and earth when the most high created it so you see that what they are bringing is a purely a fraud and it's going to be shown in the next page of what they wrote to themselves we, are, we will be by this challenging those that come here to tell us they are worshipping the creator of heaven and earth by worshipping God which was a creation of the slave masters to tell us if it is the same spirit being that these people were worshipping that they are worshipping today. This is very important and that is where we are going to throw our challenge to you as well. And going further it says this day of rest is very strictly observed in the exercise of dancing etc and this is likewise their day appointed for the circumcision of their children there is one of their fetishes it seems whom they acknowledge superior to all the rest when anyone asks them what notion they entertain of the deity they answer that he is black like themselves and that instead of being their bountiful benefactor, he acts like a tyrant and an oppressor. To this, our historian replied in the language of a missionary that God is white like us, is good and gracious, and has done great and marvelous things for us, that he descended from heaven to earth for our sakes and was crucified by the Jews for our salvation that after the dissolution of these our earthly tabernacles our souls shall take their flight to the celestial regions but all these seemed mere cant and jargon to these negroes who chiefly opposed the divine providence alleging that they were no ways indebted to the deity but our interest is where it tells us that this person is white or the god is white like them remember they describe themselves in the language of a missionary a missionary is someone who has a mission and we need to understand what the mission is and remember these were the same people that wouldn't teach the slaves in their place to read and write so they don't get to know now what is their mission and remember they are telling them that they they eat it they didn't see it or nobody saw it this is what they are writing and at that time remember the negroes did not know how to read or write their own language so but let us move forward to show you exactly where they are the whole giveaway is you see further down where it says if we will but give ourselves the least time to reflect we may easily discern the weakness and insufficiency of such arguments with the negroes especially on the absurdity of insisting on the whiteness of the god of the christians in opposition to the black deity could no better way be found out to confute, note the word, confute the Negroes than by recommending a God to them of another color from their own. So you see that they were looking for better way to confute the Negroes, which is another word for confuse. They needed to deceive the Negroes. This is as at 1799. And that should tell you that there is no way they could have brought you the creator of heaven and earth. They brought you the God of Christians which is totally different from the God of Muslims, totally different from the God of Jews, and was at the same time totally different from the creator of heaven and earth. And this is the challenge we are throwing to those that think we should come and believe whatever they believe in or the book that was given to them by someone they don't even know. So further down, we see where it tells us what happens when a Negro takes ill or falls sick and goes to the priest. The reason the 
Negroes somehow tend to look at the doctors as priests or something today is because at that time the priests were also the doctors and they always expect divine healing. This is why you see that the false prophets and those priests you see in sub-Saharan Africa today, they are easily getting a lot of people coming to them to look for healing. That was because the priests at that time were the doctors as well. That was when the Negroes worshipped the creator of heaven and earth and that was why sickness was rare within them, which we can show you documented by the slave masters themselves but then he goes further down to tell us something of interest he says the natives of biafra offer up all they have even their most darling infants to the devil and they are extremely addicted to the study and practice of the black art and all magical incantations flattering themselves that by those mysterious operations they can influence the elements and all the products of nature when we talk here of the devil we do not mean the evil spirit which our Christian divines treat of, but a thing, a being, a spirit only, which we are at a loss to define or give any adequate idea of, but in all probability it may be the sole object of some people's worship and frequently it is no more than a chimera of their priests. But our interest is the fact that the spirit being they could not define, they chose to call it devil and the people bought into it. That's why you see today whatever thing traditional the people that the negroes that have uh, uh, embraced christianity islam or judaism tend to look at it as of the devil even if it saves their lives for example they see a bullet killing you as coming from god but if you have something be it anything that you could do to prevent that bullet from killing you they believe that is from the devil if you doubt what we're saying we challenge you to do some basic investigation about it. Dateline 1868 Let us reference West African countries and peoples, British and native, with the requirements necessary for establishing the self-government recommended by the Committee of the House of Commons, 1865, and the Vindication of the African Race by James Africanus Bill Horton and it was published in 1868. There we see the religion of the Igbo tribe. It says, and reading from above the highlighted portion, we come now to the consideration of the most important subject relative to the Igbo race, visibly their religion and probable origin. Now remember, it says the most important subject relative to the Igbo race. Everyone who has read a little knows that the biggest way to colonize the Negro is religion. So that is why you see if you go to a place like Nigeria today, the Yorubas have discovered that as well and they have deployed it extensively. Even when the Yorubas were pagans and they are not even Negro, they are Negroid. So they deployed that extensively and today the former pagans are now bringing the message of the most high creator of heaven and earth to people who were never pagans. So that's why you see churches like Redeemed, Deeper Life, Name It, all trooping to Igbos and capturing them and milking them because that's the same thing the Europeans did, the same thing the Arabs did, so the same thing they, were, they are all doing together. So that's why you notice that they run there in search of miracles that are not there. The only place the Christians win the so-called pagans vis-a-vis -vis the Igbos, as it were, and the Negroes, is in the home movie. That's in the movie where it is um, choreographed. It doesn't happen in real life. So you see the difference. But let us move forward. The religion of the Igbos is Judaism intermixed with numerous pagan rites and ceremonies. They believe in the existence of one almighty, omnipotent, omnipresent being, whom they worship as such and regard as the omniscient God who concerns himself with the affairs of man. He is known by the name of Chuku, contracted sometimes into Chi. They also admit the existence of another god or a superior being who in one part of the country is called Orisa and in another Chukuokike or God the Creator or the Supreme God, thus showing that the nation believes in the division of the Godhead in two beings, each equal in power and influence yet different to the Godhead but the existence of a third 
person does not seem to be admitted or known by them. Chuku, the omniscient God who is supposed to preserve them from harm, communicates with his people through his priests who reside in a city set apart as holy by all the nation. This place is called Aro or Ano, to which pilgrimages are made, not only from all parts of Igbo, including the tribes along the coast, visit Le Oru or whatever, but our interest is what their religion was. Now we will challenge you, the Christian, the Muslim, the Jew, the Buddhist, the Hindu, all the other religions all over the world to come and tell us if these people were not worshipping the creator of heaven and earth. At least today, everyone knows that the Trinity doctrine is not biblical, it's just an European concoction. It has no scriptural basis. So we now challenge you that wants us to believe whatever the slave masters brought to explain to us if these people were not worshipping the almighty creator of heaven and earth. If you can prove this to us, we'll be happy to hear. Now let us move forward. We are going to conclude and transfer the next path to part 2 of the same series. So before we conclude this path, there is going to be some people that are going to say, hey, it's a lie because um, as Jai Crowder was supposedly a Yoruba man, but as Jai Crowder was a Negro captured as a slave. He was certainly not Yoruba. He was a Negro and a pagan at, at that. Because if you remember, Crowder is not a Yoruba name. It's only a Jai which we don't know where he got it from. Chances are that the slave masters brainwashed him with that name. Remember, he was about 11 or 12 when he was captured. How come no one knows the last name of his father? His father was supposedly killed in the raid. So how come no one knows? But let's read a little account of him before we round up. So if we reference Samuel Crowder, the slave boy who became Bishop of the Niger by Jesse Page. And he was, um, he was the Bishop of the Niger Territory and um, I think died around 1888 or whenever. But the book is what we're looking at. We will be rounding up with this reference. But in part two, we'll continue with what we're saying about connecting the dots. So from the book we see about the work of Crowder, it says the work on the Niger with which his name will be forever identified is throughout a remarkable evidence of the advantage of employing native agency if only to save a needless sacrifice of European lives and at the same time exhibits what the gospel can do and is doing when confronted with the hedonism on the one hand and a debased form of Mohammedanism on the other. Of course, the reader will not imagine that there have been no failures, no disappointments and breakdowns. But our interest is where it tells you the needless sacrifice of European lives. You see that when you think, oh, they made sacrifices to bring you the gospel, that's not correct. Because at that time, the Negroes were afraid of everything white. So every white they saw was like coming to capture and uh, them as slaves. So they would attack the white person, which they turned to say, they were eating them. So you see how subtle the serpent could be. So now you see on the right it says the time has now come when we can no longer plead ignorance from missionaries of every branch of the Catholic Church of Christ. We hear of the sufferings of the Negro. So they were bringing it at the time they, they were claiming to be coming to stop the slave trade. So there were two sides to it. While they were busy creating the chaos they were busy trying to create order out of the chaos. So they come to say, oh no, the reason you are facing these wars and slave raids is because you are worshipping the devil. So if you can embrace whatever we are bringing, then the slave raids will stop. But that is not the end of the story. But let us look at one or two things about this crowd at first and we postpone whatever thing we have seen to the next part. So from the highlighted portion, it tells us that the cruel and pitiless character of paganism is here fully revealed. Now notice that the Christians and Muslims that were capturing the slaves were not seeing themselves as cruel and pitiless. It is now the pagans that they were capturing. You see how it is that the, the victims are now the people that are barbaric. So it goes further to say, in one respect at least, the superstitious fear of the poor African is well founded, for upon his country has settled an evil spirit in verity and truth, and that demon is called slavery. 
in the mere mention of the word with the knowledge of what it means one realizes how weak at the strongest is language to express the truth words of burning flame are wanted to describe this awful curse there was a time when the hearts of the english people were thrilled and shocked with their own responsibility in the matter and we made perhaps the costliest sacrifice in history for the sake of moral principle it became high high, high time to act a hundred years ago our ships carried their share of 38,000 out of 74,000 slaves exported annually and Granville Sharp sent the Lord Chancellor a cutting from a newspaper advertising the sale of a black girl at a public house in the Strand. There is no need to tell the story over again. Wilberforce as well as Wellington will be never forgotten for peace had her very victories as well as war. The patient and prayerful agitation of years was crowned by the passing of an act of parliament which struck the feathers from the slave on English ground. Immediately, our cruisers appeared in African waters to capture the slaves, those and set the living threats at liberty. So now, you see that they, they got 38,000 out of 74,000 slaves at that time, the, the same English people, but the pagans were barbaric. So you see what we are talking about. On the opposite page, you see where it shows you that Arabs receiving slaves in the market. For if you look at it, you will see that the slaves were naked while the Arabs wore clothes. And the people selling also wore clothes. That should at least tell you on face value that the people that were selling were different from the people they were selling. Two different things. But let us just make one or two um, references and tidy up with Crowder. So further again, you see where it says early in the year 1821. Now remember that 1821 was when the freed slaves were coming to settle back in Liberia. So this should tell you what is going on. In the midst of the Ayo or Yoruba country, a devastating war was being waged. The army of the Mohammedan Fula tribe, that's the Fulanese, swelled by a miscellaneous crowd of escaped slaves and man stealers ravaged the country to right and left sweeping everything before them they came at last to a shogun a flourishing town mustering three thousand fighting men so you see three thousand fighting men they are using and you are telling us that um they just woke up and like a chief could just to do the capturing so but that three thousand capturing men is where the your so-called nigerian army came from so it says the infected inhabitants had no warning in most of the huts, the women were peacefully preparing the morning meal and the men were either absent or had no time to seize their weapons. Fierce warriors surrounded the fence which protected the town. A short sharp struggle ensued. The six gates were broken through and victors poured into the town. Here all was panic and despair. Terrified women caught up their little ones and bidding the elder children to follow tried to escape in the bush. In many cases, however, they fatally impeded themselves with baggage from their hearts. The fullers swiftly pursued them, flinging lessons over their heads and drawing them half choked back into their hands. So now, if you look at this, it gives you a narrow picture of how the slave race were conducted. But at least the good thing is a capture that it was done by the Fulanese. So now it tells you also that it was the Mohammedan army, that's the Muslims. But you hear today they tell you that islam forbids the slave trade and that the people the negroes sold themselves so you see the reason that lie is able to sell is able to remain afloat even when it's a lie even though it has now expired is because the negroid group takes sides with the slave masters to help propagate the lie so that's why you if you go to nigeria now you hear the northerners will tell you that oh no it was the Igbos that sold themselves because that's what they have been accultured to do. And the Negroid group, like the slave master said, are not very smart. So they are easier to use against the Negroes. So you see in the picture on the right, it shows a Jai Crowder being ca captured. Now you would think it's one person capturing them. But if you have watched our previous series, how the slave raids were conducted, you will know that that's not how it happened because they killed his father in the raid. Now, if you notice, the story is saying, 
while the women were preparing food in the morning because the slave raids were usually conducted early hours of the morning so that they would just when people are waking up before they leave the town so that they can raise an alarm to wake people up to run away so that's where will the parents be at that time you know if you notice from this account even though you have to read all the accounts to understand and get the clear picture of what could have transpired so he says where the fuller was capturing little ajay so now what we are telling you is that crowder was not a yoruba but a negro living in yoruba land you know they make it look like every black person is the same they made it look like yorubas were all everybody there was yoruba and there were no other small small tribes that are not yorubas there there are there are negro groups there different from the yorubas and if you doubt what we're saying we're gonna take it a little further before we round up so in conclusion let us look at a history of the colonization of africa by alien races written by sir harry h johnston and it was published in 1899 we see the following dr craft will also be referred to in the chapter on explorers the church missionary society educated the first protestant negro bishop in the person of samuel crowder of the niger its work met with some success on the west coast of africa as regards the number of whatever but our interest is where it says the first protestant negro bishop in the person of samuel crowder now the question becomes when did yoruba start bearing english names samuel crowder if you remember he was captured at about 11 or 12. so if he was 11 or 12 that would be about the same age equian that was captured now if equian that at 11 was captured and he was at least able to remember his name from gustavus vasa to equian that should tell you that Crowder should have also been able to remember his name if he was Yoruba, at least to tell us what his Yoruba last name was. What was his mother's name? What was his father's name? We have no records of this. And even if we did, remember, if they were living in Yoruba land, because the only reason they could have been raided or that community was raided was because they were pagans and they were Negroes. It's only Negroes that were being sold. If you were not Negro, you were not going to be captured. And if you were Negro and not Pagan, you were also not going to be captured. Unless if you were converted to Islam, that's when they will let you alone. The raids were being done by the Arabs, the Fulanese, the Tuaregs and the uh, so-called Barbers. That's how it was done. So if uh, Crowder was indeed Yoruba as we were being told, we should be able to know who his father was and his Yoruba last name. We should have also been able to know what happened to the mom. So, whatever be the case, we challenge you to do some research about this because what happened is obviously that they may have taken, picked up one Negro, brushed him up, brainwashed him with the religion and then sent him down to come and um, sell that same religion to the Negroes. Remember again, in the case of Equiano, while Equiano was saying in the Bible he saw the laws of his land written down, he also led, had concerns about the plight of his siblings who were being captured as slaves. Crowder didn't have that option. Crowder was more interested in selling the gospel, which he was uh, sent to come and do because he was a missionary. Whereas Equiano, even where he was, remembered the plight of his brothers and sisters because he wasn't classically conditioned for that. If you check today, no matter how many Biafrans, no matter how many Ambazonians are murdered, the churches in Yoruba land, be it deeper life, be it redeemed, do not have or show any concern to humanity. That should tell you exactly what we are talking about. But now, uh, we have taken so long on this video, that is why we want you to look back and connect the dots and ask yourself, could what they brought be simply seen as the message of the creator of heaven and earth just because they have a book? Remember, the only reason people believe that Christianity and Islam could be true is because of the book. But they forgot that what they brought was what the Negroes were doing, written down, not anything new. And above all, they do not obey what the books are saying. If you checked very well, you will see that both religions do not keep the laws of the creator of heaven and earth. So this is why we started here with both the times and calendars. 
so that you don't think that by not going to school on Sunday or having a weekend that you were obeying the creator of heaven and earth because those days have all been changed and altered at some point in history which we don't know unless we do a comprehensive research about them. We do hope you will find time to conduct your research. We hope we have also given you some thought-provoking things you could research on. We thank you very much for listening and we thank you indeed for your time. Peace.